I'm speaking with you today to make a pitch that we need to rethink what we mean by resilience in the face of climate change. This is mainly an ideas talk, so I'll start with framing the problem. Then I'll show you how scenarios modeling can further the discussion. And then we'll look at the choices that lay before us. Resilience to climate change has become the holy grail for restoration, but we need to unpack that term. Typically, resilience is studied as the time to return to an equilibrium state following a perturbation, like Hurricane Irma that hit the mangroves in 2017. This is a pulse disturbance. So there's a before and an after. In a press disturbance, the stressors don't go away. For example, conversion to agriculture and the roads and canals in the remnant Everglades. And then there's a ramp disturbance, which does not stabilize, but rather continues to intensify over time with no end in sight. Trying to hold the Everglades stationary in the face of sea level rise and warming may not be possible. Our concept of resilience is poorly suited to a non-stationary world. Stationarity is the idea that we can use the past to predict the future. But thanks to climate change, the past rules no longer apply. But if the rules are changing going forward, how do you plan for it? I will argue that we need to take a non-stationary view, not only of the climate, but also the Everglades itself and its restoration. We need a non-stationary brand of resilience as we face climate change that can allow the system to respond in non-stationary ways. We need to invoke a more dynamic definition of resilience, wherein we allow the system to reorganize and undergo change. And we envision success in terms of the persistence of the function, structure, identity, and feedbacks, while avoiding crossing over into an undesirable regime. So it's half time in Everglades restoration. When the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan was, was signed into law 20 years ago, restoring the system to historical condition was a way to make it more resilient to the presses and pulses it faced. But now that climate change is in the mix, is it simultaneously the best defense against sea level rise and warming? So we find ourselves at a crossroads. Two reports that came out in the last year highlight this growing tension in Everglades restoration. In a report aptly titled Momentum, the agency in charge of Everglades restoration proclaims that the best hope for Everglades resiliency to future changes is to hold the course, holding on to the original plan and capitalizing on its momentum. Meanwhile, the government agency charged with reviewing the progress of Everglades restoration urges managers to revisit goals and expectations potentially shifting the ecological objectives. So as we take stock of our current position, scenarios modeling can help us visualize different future outcomes, identify vulnerabilities and opportunities, and ask what goals are realistic. For example, one of the most important structures in the Everglades is the vegetation gradient from seagrass in the bay to mangrove forest to freshwater marsh. There has been an expectation that restoring historical flows would push back against rising seas, essentially holding the sea at bay. Is this realistic? In 2017, we published some scenarios modeling using ELM, the Everglades landscape model. Scenarios modeling is not about predictions, but rather a way of playing what if. We simulated ecological outcomes for three scenarios, a baseline of 2010 conditions, and two climate change scenarios from OBI, both of which included 
a degree and a half of warming, an increase in evapotranspiration, and half a meter of sea level rise. The only difference between these two scenarios is whether rainfall increased or decreased by 10%. Looking at the salinity profile, the baseline scenario with 2010 conditions closely matches the current condition of the Everglades. This orange curve is the 0.4 meter topographic contour, and this red curve is the saltwater front, where saltwater can first be detected. The salinity is really only above 3 PSU, shown here in blue, in Whitewater Bay and in some of the peripheral ponds. So let's watch the saltwater front in response to the decreased rainfall scenario. Notice that the saltwater front closely hugs the 0.4 meter contour, except where it bows inland in response to the eastern canals. And salinity steeply increases well above 3 PSU, close to the saltwater front. So what difference would it make if we had the same amount of warming and evapotranspiration and sea level rise, but increased rainfall? Once again, I want you to watch the saltwater front. In the increased rainfall scenario, the saltwater front is very similar, suggesting that saltwater intrusion is mainly driven by topography and canals regardless of freshwater flow. But the salinity regime changes much more gradually in the increased rainfall scenario compared to the decreased rainfall scenario. So although increased freshwater availability may have a limited effect on how far inland saltwater intrudes, it can make a big difference in how gradually high salinities are reached providing more opportunities for adaptation and migration. We also looked at shifts in habitat. The baseline condition is similar to today with a broad freshwater marsh shown here in yellow, a mangrove fringe shown here in green, and open water shown in blue, really only in whitewater bay and scattered ponds among the mangroves. In this scenario, with increased warming and decreased rainfall, the mangroves expand inland by up to 15 kilometers, hugging that saltwater front. And there is some drowning of mangroves along Florida Bay and Whitewater Bay. In the scenario with increased warming and increased rainfall, the mangroves pushed inland to an almost identical degree. Future saltwater intrusion and mangrove encroachment may be driven by topography and canals with little influence by the amount of freshwater flow. And this simulation highlights another vulnerability. The increased freshwater flow in the increased rainfall scenario combined with sea level rise to vastly expand the amount of open water. So a certain amount of loss of freshwater marsh may be baked in with sea level rise. The main question being what it is converted to. Conversion of freshwater marsh to mangroves would be preferable to open water, especially as we don't know whether seagrass beds would succeed along with the open water. This is not to say that increased freshwater flow would have this effect but rather it calls our attention to this aspect of ecosystem vulnerability going forward. Thus far in the islands of Florida Bay, mangroves appear to be holding their own in the face of sea level rise, expanding in both open water at the island perimeters and inland into freshwater habitat. If freshwater marsh will be progressively pushed out by sea level rise, succession of mangroves would be a welcome alternative to open water. Maybe this wouldn't be unhelpful resilience to sea level rise. Freshwater marshes are also threatened by drought, which may be more severe in the future. In a 2015 paper looking at hydrologic responses to the same decreased rainfall scenario as we did, 
None guesser at all suggested that parts of the Everglades may cease to be wetlands, becoming mesic or xeric. It's hard to visualize or even accept a non-stationary Everglades, but we may have to. Scenarios modeling can help us conceptualize and build resiliency to a world in which sea level and temperature keep going up. Over time, we may need to move away from persistence-based resiliency aimed at historical fidelity and instead do the very hard work of identifying and accepting changes that are inevitable and identifying what goals are possible for a non-stationary Everglades. When the goal is historical fidelity, everyone knows what that looks like. If the ramp disturbance takes that off the table, we would need to have hard conversations about what defines the Everglades. We can't have it all. We will have to make choices. That may be the most wicked part of all. Well, I appreciate your attention and I hope that I've convinced you that we need to rethink resilience in the face of climate change and sea level rise. And I'd actually like to end by asking you some questions. How can we overcome the challenges to this wicked problem? Even with adaptive management, our decision-making structure is poorly suited to climate change. For example, the Endangered Species Act does not allow us to balance currently threatened species with those we anticipate being threatened in the future. Is there political will to reorient restoration? Can public support allow for a pivot? And how do we resolve conflicts among stakeholders with different priorities?